Hey, welcome to today's Awesome Marriage Podcast. Thank you for joining us. You are going to love this podcast. My special guest is Nellie Harden. She's an author, a speaker, a family life and leadership coach, and founder of the 6570 Family Project. She's been married for over 20 years. Nellie is mom to four teenage daughters. She believes in a life of intention and making dreams and goals realities. The topic is life-giving rhythms in parenting. She has some of the absolute best parenting ideas I've ever heard. You're going to love this. Let's go to the studio right now. Nellie, welcome to Boston Marriage Podcast. Thank you for saying yes. I'm so, I was so excited when you did, and I'm excited for today when we get to talk. Thanks again for, for saying yes. Oh, thank you for having me on. No, you're welcome. So, uh, for people who may not know you a lot, let's kind of get into this deal that you've got this career in biology and psychology. You've got a behavior background from humpback whales to human kids to families. <laughs> so how did you get from biology to family life coaching? Well, I think it goes uh, underneath the surface to say why I was so um, interested in that. You know, I grew up in the Midwest. I was uh, surrounded by the Great Lakes, but certainly not oceans. Yet I had just this calling, this this uh, urge in me since I would say early elementary to study whales. And the fact that I went through school, I even went to college in the middle of the country at Indiana University. And I, I was able to still do that. And I accomplished that. So, but I really love the combination and the, the interweaving of biology and psychology, because I love to know, like, the nuts and bolts, how things are actually looking and working and firing and things. But then how does that come across? How is that expressed? How is that explored in experiential and in behavior, right? Mm. And so I think it's such a unique, uh, you know, combination of uh, places that you can study. And so I went in that for a long time and I, I was able to study animals in the wild and also in captivity. And it's really interesting to me how much that comes into play in parenting and in the work that I do now to have been able to study and witness what, for lack of a better word, what really raw parenting, black and white survival parenting looks like, and the purpose of what this child rearing time is, in order to, you know, we are raising adults, we're not raising kids in order to get them ready for the world. And so I'm really grateful for that time in my life. And then um, I retired from all of that. And within a year of retiring from that, my husband went into ICU with cardiac failure in his early 30s. And it it's a really long story, years long story. But the long and short of it is, I was able to then take everything that I had been taught and uh, put it into practice within my own family because we had to make behavioral changes. We had to have communication different than we'd ever had it before. We had four kids that were four and under, and we didn't know if my husband was going to make it or not, right? Well, and we were going through all of that, and we really, my husband's still here, by the way. We've been married for 22 years now, um, but uh, we went through all of that. And about two years after that, I was sitting in church and we were new to church at the time. We just, and that's an entirely other podcast that I could fill up as far as how we came to the church. But um, we had only been really active in the church for about two years at that time. It was 2012. All of this uh, stuff was behind us, uh, some lingering things, but mostly behind us. And I was just called. I was called to uh, get up and and it was, okay, you have helped your family get through this. You have the tools. You have developed the resources. Now go share it with other people. And I came out of that service and I looked at my husband. And I was like, I think I need to go and help families with like uh, building family discipline and leadership. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> I know, right? And I, I feel like that's when you know it's from the Lord, right? When you're like, I don't know. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this is what I'm supposed to do. And I started yeah. off small and, and uh, I started talking here and here, just small things. And then that was, you know, 11 years ago and it's grown into what it is today. So that's 
That's the long and short of it. <laughs> That's awesome. I've got to ask a little bit about what you learned from humpback whales, though, because they whales fascinate me, too. Oh, yeah. Well, they're just, they're so majestic. And I've had some of my, even though I, I didn't even know, you know, the, the beauty and the, the majesty of, of Christ back then, I had some of my closest, closest encounters with God when I was working with whales. And just one, uh, one of these encounters, let me um, uh, describe to you. I was in Australia, uh, northern Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. We were doing some research up there. And uh, we were um, doing observation work and we would record their songs because their song is pretty much the same every year. But there's some changes and every male sings the same song, which and it's so uh, but it can be 10 minutes long. It could be 15 minutes long, but it's the same song. Everyone sings it. So, you know, it's not just a, you know, hey, Bob, what are you doing today for lunch? You know, one whale talking to another when especially these mating calls it's the same song over and over so we dropped a hydrophone over uh overboard because in the boat i was in it was small enough that we could feel it through the bottom through the hull of the the boat that we were in so we dropped it over overboard and just we're in wide open ocean here let me give you an idea of how small this boat was it was small enough that i could hold on to the side and drop my head under with a snorkel on and look underneath that's you know how small this thing was and so um, that's what I did, though. And there was a, a two others on my team. Thankfully, we went to different sides of the boat to do this. But uh, so we dro- we dropped over and we looked. And under our boat, with the sun just pouring in and like a spotlight on this, uh, it was an adolescent male humpback, and he was vertical in the water, pirouetting just slowly with those huge humpback, you know, pectoral fins, just kind of dancing and, and uh, latency behind him as he would, you know, drag through the water. And he, he was just singing this song and we could f- literally feel it. And when you're laying on the boat, then we could feel it in our hearts. We could feel it in every bone of our own bodies. And we just, I just sat there and watched this. And it was such a magnificent moment And it was so powerful, yet so gentle. And when it comes and you're like, okay, that's beautiful. But how does that, you know, pertain to what you're doing? And I think with parenting, too, we have the position where we can be so powerful, right? We can, you know, for lack of a better word, lord over them. We can you you do this, right? We can be on that big chair and them uh, down there. But if we're doing that, then we're missing the beauty and the peace that could be coming through that and the growth of that child. And so having that power and, and that we have, but being peaceful within that power was something I take away from that moment that pertains to parenting and and what I get to do now. And there's, I, I remember witnessing, and I was doing observations on gorillas actually uh, another time and just seeing these moms that were so patient with these babies that were not doing what mama wanted them to do at all. Right. And mom was trying to teach them how to do something. And, and she just kept grabbing them. Nope, that's not, nope, that's not how you do it. Nope. And she was so patient and really seeing, okay, she is trying to get them ready for the wild. And in our human, you know, messiness that we have, It is we are raising children to get them ready for the world, the messy world that's out there. And so we have, especially I feel like in Western culture, have this idea of we are raising kids. And once they're 18, they age out of childhood. But then you're just releasing them to I'll just, you know, keep with the metaphor and say the wild. Right. You're releasing them to the wild instead of launching them into it equipped with the knowledge, the faith, their gifts, their talents, the knowledge of how to use them out in the world, their worth, right? Their self-esteem, their confidence. So there's a really big difference between releasing and launching your kids. And what happens out in the animal world if these children are abandoned and do not learn how to use what they need to use out in the world it doesn't go well, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. exactly. And we see that today. And maybe it's not, unfortunately, sometimes it is, but many times it's not a physical 
right? Uh, not survival that they're going through, but definitely emotional and mental and spiritual. So equip them so they can go out into the world ready for the world. So as a the mom side of you, you just are launching your oldest daughter. This I am. <laughs> so it's all coming, all this stuff you've been talking about now, it, and now you're in the middle of it. Yeah. But, is that interesting? I mean, is that just thinking, oh my gosh, I, this is me. I'm not talking to someone else about this. I'm, this is our this is our life right now. I know. Sometimes it's it's funny because as a family, we're going through and doing my program right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's just so funny, you know. It, it it's uh, videos, and so it's still my voice. It's still my work, but at least it's third party because it's not me standing in front of them doing it. Right. It's it they can kind of see it as separated a little bit, but we're going through that. And just today, uh, I was at orientation uh, for her college, and we were asked. Uh, we had these little clickers actually. Uh, instead of clapping, they give us clickers, and they said, "Do you feel like your child?" is ready to um, to come into this world and be, you know, safe and thrive. And I, I was able to click that. I really was. I, I really feel like she's ready. Now, will she go there? Will she? Uh, yeah, she'll go there. But will she um, make mistakes? Probably. Will she, you know, go there and be overwhelmed, especially at the beginning? Absolutely. Right. But we have done everything that we could do here at home. And now she needs to go and apply that in the world that she she is uh, creating there. So yeah, it's it's a big day for this conversation right here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just love the analogy between that and as you talked about the whales and the gorillas and, you know, the principles are there and we have so much to yeah. learn from them. I love what you said about the patience of the mom gorilla. Mm. I mean, you know, I think there's every mother at some point would like to have more patience. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, and just uh, to see that, that's awesome. Yep. So let's move on to the uh, 6570 Family Project. Let's talk about that, the idea behind it and what it is. And yeah, so going along with the same idea, I, you know, it's funny. Our family has um, has run a few different businesses here and there, and, and this one is mine. Um, that I have, and it is my love, it is my passion, and it is everything. But all of our stuff is born from our own lives. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, we experience something, we learn something, and then we go and teach something. And the entire idea behind the 6570, which, by the way, is how many days are in 18 years? There are 6,570. So it's a very, it's a, a big reminder to show up intentionally every day. And it does not mean that you will be perfect every day. In fact, I do not believe in perfectionism. And honestly, as a parent, I really uh, urge people to stay away from trying to be perfect because we are raising other adults here, right? We're raising other humans. And if we're trying to be perfect, then that is a pressure that we are putting on them in order to do the same, right? And no one is perfect. And in order for them to to learn, how do I get up when I fall down? How do I apologize when I fail? How do I face someone when I've embarrassed myself, right? They learn that from watching what's happening at home in their natural environment right there. So as a parent, we're going to mess up. And then we show up to their room and say, you know what? I really shouldn't have said that. I'm really sorry. Let's try that again. Can you explain to me a little bit more what you wanted to tell me? And I'm going to be calm now. And again, I apologize, right? So they know when they overreact at some point, which absolutely will happen, they can approach that person with kindness and compassion and sincerity and say, you know what? I overreacted. I'm really sorry. Can we try that again? Right? Yeah. So what we're learning there. So anyway, the 6570 is all about showing up with intention during that time and building this one foundation. So I use the, you know, kind of an analogy of a lava field a lot of times. And because that's, you know, the world can feel like a lava field sometimes. And if you are in a lava field and you have one little platform here and you have another little platform, you know, way over there and another one over there, you are first of all, never feel safe, right? Because the lava is always right there. 
You never feel safe. You have to figure out how to get to the next platform if you need it. Maybe you learned a lot about scholastics here. So, okay, I'm good. I'm on this one. I'm good. Oh, wait, now I need to figure out uh, someone needs me to do something, but I'm overbooked because I'm in hustle culture. So I need to figure out my time management, but that's way over there. How am I going to get there? There's all this anxiety all, all the time versus building one very strong, firm foundation at an address right at the cross section of understanding their biology, their psychology, their faith, and understanding how to be in and relate to culture, but not be of culture, right? And so right in the middle of that cross section, you build your foundation. That foundation is built, out, it's a three tier, just think of a three tier cake, right? But much stronger, <laughs> it's yes. a three tier cake. And it is made out of worthiness. So that bottom foundation is worth. They have to know that they are worthy to be here. And then the the next uh, layer to that is going to be self-esteem, right? Their value and appreciation of self and others. And then that top tier is their confidence, their true belief in themselves. And if we can build that foundation at that address, and build it along the way, then they will be ready to launch. Now, yours, mine, my child, anyone that's listening to this, it's going to look a little bit different, but it's still, you know, someone's, uh, how someone uh, feels worthy. For example, um, there's five elements to that. They need to be seen. They need to be heard. They need to know they're loved. They need to know they belong and that they have a purpose. But the way my daughter feels seen and heard might be different than how your daughter or someone else's child feels okay. seen and heard, right? So it's uniquely made for that individual, but the structure is the same. And then when they're at the top of that, they're far away from the lava. They don't feel like they have to be anxious all the time. They're like, I got this. They can have their own little oasis up there chilling on a, you know, little uh, hammock up there. But and they can really build on and they can launch from and they can grow on that one single foundation. And that's really what the 6570 Family Project is all about. It is building that foundation at that address within that time frame. That is so good. You, you said something that I, I really liked when you said it. It's not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. so you've got four daughters. Can you give an example just from them of how you might? what you did different from one to the other. Absolutely. I call my daughters four corners of a square because they are all very, very different, including my middle two, our twins, very, very, very different. And so uh, let's just take discipline, which is part of that structure that you're building right there, right? You need tools to build that structure. And that's what um, we really talk about in the 6570 Family Project. What are those tools and how do I use them? But one of those tools is discipline. And how I, I discipline one twin, uh, I'll just take them since um, they're a good comparative analysis there. Yeah. How I do uh, talk to one is very different than how I have to talk to another. One requires me just to look at her a certain way. And she's like, oh, yes, I know exactly what you need me to do. I'm sorry. The other one typically needs a lot more coaching and a lot more, uh, you know, talks. Sometimes I've even had to, you know, uh, we have a camera in our kitchen, uh, for example, and I've had to bust that out sometimes. And because she didn't believe me right on how she was behaving. And so I had to bring that out. And then she was like, oh, oh, yeah, OK, I get it. Right. And so just how they're disciplined and, and keep in mind, discipline means for all the listeners, discipline means teaching. Right. Discipline is not consequences. Those are two separate things. Sometimes discipline involves consequence, but every time discipline is teaching. And so depending on what the circumstance is there. So how I discipline each one of my kids is so, so, so different. Knee to knee conversations like sitting down and we sit, you know, crisscross applesauce, knee to knee, just looking into each other's eyes. So the distractions of the world aren't around. She knows that I am serious and 100% invested in her right now and vice versa, right? And so when some things are happening, we sit down and we have those. Some kids I've had, some of my kids I've had to have more of those with than others, right? 
And so it just really, really depends. And it takes getting to know your child for who they are and who they're becoming, right? Uh, just having come from a lot of talks over the last two days over, you know, having to do with kids. And there's this misnomer out there today that you go and find yourself, right? You go and, you know, basically like pick your identity out of a field of, you know, flowers is what it, it kind of makes it sound like, you know, oh, uh, they haven't discovered themselves yet. Uh, yourself isn't being discovered. Yourself is being built, right? So deciding where am I going and is my behavior right now aligned with who I am trying to become, right? So helping them along that journey too is very different with each child. And you have to know them in order to do that with them. That's so good because I think I, I think all of us at some point wish we had, we had a formula and it worked with every kid. Yeah. And it just doesn't. And what you're saying, maybe people are listening say, well, that takes a lot of work. And it does, doesn't yeah. it? But but don't you think it, it keeps you doing on the front end, it's going to help. You're going to have less problems as you go through it because you've you've done what you needed to do as far as knowing that child and now how to teach, to correct, all those kind of things. Absolutely. So here's the thing. And, and you know, the cautionary tales that have led me here as well in doing this work are just as profound, if not more, than the tales of my own kids and and those that I've helped, you know, get to a point of what I call self-disciplined leadership, which is where you want them to be before they leave home. They came into the world as uh, parent-led, right? You did everything for them. And throughout this 6570, you are gradually moving them down a spectrum to self-disciplined leadership. Because in order to do anything in this world, you have to be able to lead yourself first and foremost. And so uh, going on and doing that and how do I get to that point is, is essential parenting. But I've seen what happens when you don't. We work with people as a family. We work with people who are in their early 20s, who are in their 30s, who are even beyond that, who didn't have this foundation built when they were kids. And those consequences are big and they not only hurt themselves, but they hurt so many people around them as well. And it's it's heavy and it's hard. And that's a lesson that we've been able to show our kids and see, you know what? They just never learned this, that we're teaching you right now. And this is what happens, right? But we're going to love them and we're going to pray over them and we're going to help them anyway. But this is where we don't want you to be. And this is why we're teaching you this now. Right. Oh, that's that's so good. And it makes sense probably makes a lot more sense to your kids then when they can see the the other side of it. Oh so, yes, yeah. absolutely. So you talk about um the shift that might come as a child moves in the second half of growing up years. Is there a change what is the change that would happen from that stage to the second stage? Yeah. So the first half of childhood, um, like I kind of alluded to a little bit, is you're really building life for them, right? Okay. Their their friends are who you say they are. They're eating what you say they are, right? They're doing and going to what you say they are. And then the second half of childhood, instead of doing life for them, you're really moving and transitioning to doing life with them so that at the end of the 6570, they are doing their life, right, in a self-disciplined leadership uh, manner. And so this shift happens. I call it the great transition. And there's no certain date uh, that it happens. I'm so glad that we have 6,570 days to really do this, <laughs> this area of parenting. You know, you're always going to be their parent. But this 6570 is your highest impact zone for the rest of their life. And so... I'm I'm just very grateful we have <laughs> all this time. And uh, some some kids, I'm seeing this starting around age six, age seven. Some of them, I'm seeing 11, 12. So on average, it's around eight or nine, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, I hear from parents, I don't know what happened. You know, this just started coming up and she started acting like this and doing this and making these choices. And I'm like, it's all normal. It's 100% okay. And this is why it's so important to understand uh, biology, the, the brain functionality of what's happening in her body, and especially in young women, the endocrine system, too, to understand what's happening with the hormone levels. And 
as a parent of four young women myself, if I didn't understand this, I would probably have the vocabulary like I hear a lot of other parents of young women having going, I don't know, they're just being a teenager. They're driving me nuts. They're being rude. And that's just their job. Right. I've heard that before. I'm like, that's not really their job. Um, gaining independence is their job. Being rude is not their job. Right. And so um, and they're driving me crazy. So I'm just going to, you know, let them do whatever. And then that sets them up for so many scenarios where they could be unsafe. Right. Absolutely. And so if you understand their brain chemistry, the fact that their brain is between especially like 10 to 15 is developing like it did when they were toddlers. And then the, you see some light bulbs go off like, oh, yeah, they are acting like a, they, they did when they were a toddler. I'm like, yes, you know, it's OK. And but this time they have a lot more yeah, independence. They have a lot more words to use back at you than they did when they were two. Right. And a lot more freedom. And so it's much more challenging during the adolescent years than it was when they were um, mentally and emotionally anyway. Physically, maybe a little bit less, but mentally and emotionally much bigger than when they were toddlers. And so if we can understand that and come alongside and support that brain transition, support that frontal lobe, everything that's under your, you know, your for um, your hand, if you put it under your forehead. Uh, if we can support, OK, they are making connections right now that will last them the rest of their lives. You can think about it like a train track being laid. Right. And anyone that's ever seen, you know, a track being laid, let's just say East Coast to West Coast, it doesn't just happen overnight. Those pieces are laid one by one by one by one over time with intentionality of direction, angle, where they're going to go. And as a parent of an adolescent, we are helping them lay those tracks right now. And it takes some of that intention, even if they are not seeing it right. Uh, their brain is full of a lot of hot wires that are going all over the place right now, especially in a young woman. Uh, memories run through the emotional centers. And so they come home and they seem fine. And then they tell you about something that happened in first hour. And all of a sudden they're a puddle on the floor. And you're like, they're just insane, right? No, it's they're having a memory. They're literally reliving it. So understanding the biology is a really big coping, me coping mechanism and understanding mechanism of parenting young people today. And then how that perceives in, you know, psychology and where they're at in their faith, getting them to own their own faith before they leave home, not just, you know, borrowing the, uh, the faith, uh, you know, of their parents. And then what do I do with this whole culture thing? Because culture is constantly changing, but you don't have to be constantly changing, right? You can stand firm within culture without being of culture. So that's so good. So for parents, because I I don't know how many kids I've had tell me that I've talked to that are maybe 13 or 14. My parents still treat me like I'm 10 or something mm -hmm. like that. So how do parents know when they're there? How do they know when to make that shift? Because I don't think we, I don't think there's just a, a, it's automatic that we know, okay, now it's time to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just observe, be an observant. So if you get that question or they say, I'm not a little kid anymore, right? And then, you know, a typical parent response is, well, you're acting like one. So, you know, I'm going to do this, you know, type of thing. But instead of going there, which is our reactionary, uh, you know, response, we need to be calm. We need to say, okay, they're really not seeing themselves as that anymore. So ask them, what do you mean by that? And it won't be in the moment, right? Because they're going to go off and they're upset or what have you. But when it is calm, sit down. Eye, eye to eye. You don't need to be above them, right? But sit down eye to eye and say, I know you said earlier that I treat you like a little kid and I understand you're not a little kid anymore, but can you tell me what that means to you, right? And have them, you're partnering with them during this time. And so have them guide the sales a little bit so that they can tell you what they're feeling, what they're seeing, what they're thinking and then you can come together and say, OK, I'm going to lift you up in that. But this area, do you see how you can have uh, you might need a little bit more support? So let's work on here. But I understand what you're saying here and I want to support you in that. Uh, so really have those discussions and see them as a partner more than 
a little kid that you are raising. And I know those little kids snuggles are so cute and they're wonderful. And there was a time for those and they will still hug you and appreciate you and respect you. But we need to, as parents, respect and appreciate them for who they are growing into and becoming as well and really asking them their opinions. One of those, uh, like I alluded to earlier, one of those um, pieces of worth is that they are seen and heard. And so that is one of the things that gets them so frustrated is I don't feel like my parents are seeing me and I don't feel like my parents are actually hearing me. So do your part as a parent and listen and really see them and then have those conversations. That's that is so good. And I think, yeah, I think we have a tendency, and I'll just pick, because I've got a 14-year-old granddaughter, that it's so easy. I've heard people say, well, she's just 14, and so you're putting all these 14-year-olds in a box and yeah. taking time to, because she and I have a great relationship, and we talk and ask questions, and, you know, she loves that I listen to her, and, mm-hmm. and her parents do a good job, too. They're great parents. But I think that kids want to be listened to and they want oh, yeah. you to value what they say. And I think that it just change, it can change that whole dynamic you have between them, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. another another piece to that is ask them their opinions about your own life. That This is so valuable to be able to say, oh, you know, how you doing, mom? Actually, I'm I'm really stressed out right now. This thing is happening with work or this volunteer position or, you know, I don't know, your uncle or something. I don't know. What do you think about this? How do you think I should approach this? Right. And all of a sudden they're like, wow, my opinion on this, you know, adult thing actually matters. And she might take that. And and when some of the advice you won't take, of course, but when you do really give them props for that and say, gosh, thank you so much for letting me, uh, you know, letting me know that and giving me that perspective because I didn't see that from my perspective right then. And that was really, really helpful. Thank you. And wow, does that give them a worthy, like an uh, injection of worthiness right there? Oh, yeah, that is so good. And I think, you know, Nancy and I, our goal always, we wanted to be adult friends with our kids when Mm -hmm. they left. And I think that begins to set that, to build that foundation for that to happen. Absolutely. Then we listen to them. That's so good. So let's talk about just the things. What can couples do or people do, couples do each day, each week, each month, each year, some rhythms, routines that to be intentional to build that culture that we're talking about? Yeah. Um, well, daily, I would say to have um, what I call a, a conversion, a convergence event. You know, some people you've heard many times like have dinner around the table every night. Well, it's not dinner that's important as much as it is that you are coming together in the middle of the day, uh, you know, especially when you have adolescents, things are going all over the place. You think about like a stack of wheat that was just uh, harvested, right? It's just laying all over the place. It looks, uh, you know, like chaos. But then you have that that cinching event, that convergence event where everything comes together and that's where ideas are shared. That is where opinions are given. That is just where uh, the day is shared. This is what happened with me today. So everyone gets on the same page. For us, many times, that's a dog walk. We go on a two-mile dog walk in the afternoons. And we still do eat together a lot of times, too. But more often, it is that dog walk that you know can really get us all together. And we're just walking. You know, It's a beautiful day. We're walking the dogs. Hey, what did you do today? Oh, yeah. Oh, tell me about, you know, more about that. And we all get to just share. And so having a daily convergence event, whatever that is for you, might be breakfast, it might be bedtime, or it might be something in between, is really important to maintain that family structure. You know, we're in this together. We're a team. And that's what we do. So that's what I would definitely recommend daily. Um, Weekly, one of the best things that we have done and I I teach and teach and recommend and recommend is one-on-one time with each of your kids. And so uh, we have four kids. And so on Tuesday nights, uh, I go into um, our kids are split between the second and the third floors. And so we have two on each. And so on Tuesday nights, we go to the second floor. I go to one room. My husband goes to the other. And then on Thursday nights, we go to the third floor. I go to one. My husband goes to the other. And then the next week, we switch to whatever child we didn't get, you know, the week before. So my kids know 
every week I am going to have one-on-one -on -one time with either mom or dad. And that time is, it's, uh, I have, um, if you only have 15 minutes, just do 15 minutes, whatever that is. Uh, we do a half hour. It a lot of times leaks into a little bit longer. Um, and during those times, it is, it can be just, hey, show me what you've been working on in school, or let's talk about your interests, or let's talk about your friends, or let's talk about this really hard thing that we need to talk about right now, right? And it's ran the gamut of everything in between, but our kids really look forward to that time, and so do we. And it really helps get to know them so that you know how they can be seen, heard, love, belong, and have purpose, those, you know, those pieces of worthiness we were talking about that are individual to them. And you will find out things in that one-on-one -on -one time that you just won't on a convergence event, like as sitting around the, in the kitchen or the dining room table when, you know, maybe it's a hard subject and they don't want to say it in front of everybody or they're a little embarrassed or whatever that is. You will learn things in there that you won't learn any other time. So really important to have that time. Um, monthly, I would really recommend having a family check-in. And, you know, this could be if you want to be super formal, it could be like a family meeting. Right. Or it could just be going out to eat and, and having this family check in. I'm actually I, I have something I'm developing right now for this. It's just 15 minutes to go through. I really, really, really recommend these uh, uh, three times a year. So beginning of the school year, um, beginning of the second semester or at the start of the calendar year and then um, beginning of summer. So definitely those three times um, you want to revisit and, you know, what were your goals? Did you achieve them? What are you trying to do now? How are you helping yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally? Um, all of those things. And it goes through and it's just really fun and you get to learn um, something and there's no interrupting during that time. Right. Everyone has a platform that they can talk on and uh, you can even make it fun. You can have like call it monthly ice cream night or, you know, you have ice cream for dinner one night or something fun, but just bring that in there and have that monthly check in. And uh, so yearly, yearly, I would say just get away as parents, get away once a year. Um, and I will be honest and say that we did not do a good job of this. Um, as parents, we have always lived thousands of miles away from any family. And so it's, it's, was very difficult for us. But as they've gotten older in adolescence, we've been able to do it more. Even if it's just, you know, three, four days, get away as parents so that you can, you know, reconstruct yourselves as uh, as the couple that you are in your marriage. And you can come back and parent stronger because strong marriages are strong parents, too. Not to say you can't be a strong parent without a strong marriage as well. I completely understand that. I was raised by a single mom for my first eight years, too. But I do know that strong marriages definitely help uh, in parenting as well. And so and you have that partner there and you can feel more filled yourself um, coming back from that trip. And so I that's something I recommend. And then uh, just routines, uh, building a family culture around connection, you know, having things like tech agreements, um, chores and responsibilities. Uh, are they working? Are they, are you serving in some capacity um, as a family, um, setting expectations, being super clear with one another, just some things like that. Oh, that's so good. It's really just being intentional. Every yes. Day. Yes. You got the end goal of what you want. Well, how do we do that? Well, daily we do this. Weekly we do this. Monthly we do this. We do this every year. And if you do that consistently, not perfectly, like you said, right. you're going to when that time comes and really 65, 6,570 days seems like a lot but from raising two kids and five grandkids, it goes quick. It goes very oh, yeah. quick. And so if you're not intentional and, and the other thing, I guess we ought to say it, if someone's listening today and they think, oh my gosh, I blew it. My kid's 13 or my kid's mm. 15. Can you start there? Absolutely. You could start there. I mean, we've all seen and heard some of those stories, even of children out of the 6570, right, that then have some direction, uh, maybe in their 40s, 50s, you know, 60s from their parents before they pass or what have you. But when we're thinking about 
what can I do in order to set my child up for success in life? And again, that success is a private, a unique brand of whatever that success means for that child and that family. And so how can I set them up for success? I promise you it will include, it must include their worth, their self-esteem, and their confidence. I cannot think of anything, and I, I've been doing this for a long time now, I cannot think of anything in life that you could label as success, even uh, e even the most unique forms of it that don't include those things, right? Because you have to be able to show up and be a leader of yourself in order to go out into the world and do what you were uniquely created to do. And these are the, that's the foundation that's required for that. Oh, that's so good. So you mentioned, uh, well, let's talk about personal favorites that you guys could do that you think just a couple of things there. I know if any kids are listening to this with their parents and when you said ice cream dinner night, they probably <laughs> listen and put that on the refrigerator somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what are some of your favorites that, that you guys have done that, that really uh, feel like you've helped accomplish what you want to accomplish with these kids? Um, well, one on one time is for sure one of the biggest things that yeah. we have done. And then um, as far as siblings go, I think it's really important that siblings form, you know, a bond too, and really fill their role as a sibling, understanding you are this person's, you know, brother or sister. And you this is your this is one of the roles of your life, right? So how can you show up for that? A lot of times it's just like, oh, my kids don't get along. They, you know, they can't stand each other. Well, have they ever really dove into their role? And one of the ways that you could do that, and we've had to do this several times, is, you know what, uh, if I'm talking with one of my kids, I'm like, you know what, I really actually need some help with your sister right now. Um, she's experiencing some things that I know you've experienced too, and I know it was hard to walk through. Do you think that you could help me help her, Right. And that can really quickly drop walls of frustration or a hierarchy and be like, yeah, I can help her. I can help her. I can, I can do that, right? Because then they're given a responsibility. They are given something of worth in order to give to another sibling. So that's something that we have definitely done several times. Um, and then uh, sister nights or sibling nights, right, are just fun, especially when they get older and one or more of them can drive. They can go to the movies. They can, you know, go on little dates or whatever uh, like that. But just really fostering and encouraging that time with siblings, because let's face it, at some point, if if all goes as planned, they're going to be the ones left here after, you know, their parents are, are passed on. And so you want that to be a strong foundation of your family as well. And whatever's being built now, it goes back to that brain, that brain chemistry again, whatever's being built now is going to have lasting effects later on. And so if you're really fostering a powerful relationship now between siblings, that will last longer than, oh, they'll get along when they're adults, even though they fight like cats and dogs now. That's probably not going to be the case. Right. If they're fighting like cats and dogs now, it will keep echoing on into the future as well. Yeah. Well, you know, before we went live, you were kind of talking about your three daughters that are going to be at home when the oldest leaves for college this fall. And that that you just talked about how much they're going to miss her. And yeah. I, I get just a, a picture of the things that you guys have done well to have that. They're not going, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad she's gone. Good. You know. Could she go earlier? You know, it's it's like yeah. they're going to miss her and they're get, they value her in that relationship. And I think that as parents, we want all that. I want my kids, I wanted my kids to be friends when they got older, you know, to to have that connection at that young age that's just very special because they're, because they're brother and sister or sisters or brothers, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. I love that. Okay, so your kids are pretty close together in age. So let's talk a little bit about engaging kids say that well, and you can use yours where they're just a few years apart to what about that family that has a child every five years and so they're really uh spread out in that how any ideas or any tips for them absolutely and that was my family growing up so i'm nine and 11 years younger than my brother and sister and so um and i 
left home. I went to um, college early at 17. So they were really young when I left. Right. And I, looking back, I wish there we would have been able to see each other a lot more often during you know, their childhood and adolescence and uh, my young adulthood. And it didn't happen. But I have seen families where it did. And and that relationship is really fostered and nurtured during that time. And so um, there's another a family I work with and they have a 13 um, year old and a two year old. Right. And so aside from oh, great, we have free childcare in the house now, right? Which often happens, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? But it's also, hey, can you help me um, with this and doing things with them and still doing the one-on-one -on -one time with the older child and really just loving. Do you remember when you were this age too? And as they're going along, just helping nurture that relationship and coming back in and not being a second mother or a second father by any uh, um, stretch of the imagination, but also just coming in and being a third set of hands and really helping to raise that child. One of the things um, that you run into with last children, uh, you know, like my youngest or what have you, is that the, the youngest ones are typically the most wild um, because they, you know, have the license to baby for longer. Uh, because they don't, they weren't kicked out of the nest, uh, so to speak, like others were. And so when you have that, though, I really recommend that you find someone even outside of the home that they can play that big sister or big brother role with so that they understand that they are growing up and this is what a child looks like, right? And so we've done that with, I, I can think of at least three or four kids that have come into our lives that we help take care of that are younger than my youngest for that reason, right? Or one of the reasons that yeah. we do that so that she can see, oh, wait, I, I'm a nurturer and I can be a big grown up here too. So just something I recommend if you have uh, a big distance between, um, between your kids there too. Yeah, that's that's so good. And I think, you know, we talk a lot at Awesome Marriage about, you know, we're modeling marriage for our kids. We're also mar modeling parenting for them, too. Yes. And and that, that the more things that we do that help them be healthy adults as they grow, that gives them a foundation to do the same thing and carry that on with their kids. Yes, 100%. It's, it's so good. Um Kids get older. I remember our kids, you know, it was so easy to have family dinner every night for a long time. And it was always like, oh my gosh, we got to look the first week. Everybody's schedule. Can we get one night this week? You know, and you mentioned the, the dog walks. I mean, being creative with that. How can they make the most of the time that they do have? Because it seems like the older they get, the more, well, they're more involved usually with friends. Once they begin driving, their schedules, yeah. all the things that, that we want them, most of them to do and, and to enjoy that and to grow in that. So how do you make the most of that time when your kids are, are in those biggest, busier schedules? Yeah. And that is very true. I have four kids that are all working right now. And so it's, I mean, the calendar is insane. Um, and who's home when? I don't know. It, it's all, it's all crazy. But when you do see them, and let me preface this by saying too, that the average amount of quality time in an American family today is 15 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day of quality time. So what I really encourage people to do is figure out their time, whether that's a family schedule or whatever, and just have it uh, so you understand this is actually, we actually have more free time than we think that we do. Um, and there's a great, um, I, I work with it with my, uh, with my clients, but it's a do a pie chart that has 24, um, sections on it. That's a day. And then you want to shade in eight hours for sleep. You want to shade in whatever hours you need for work and commuting and shade in, you know, if you have a morning routine, I know I do, um, you know, shade that in and maybe, uh, you know, a bed, uh, a nighttime routine or whatever, shade that in too. Typically, you're going to be left with like three or four hours still. And you're like, I don't have three to four hours of free time a day. You actually do, right? We just are so good at filling it in our hustle culture that we are in today. 
And so once we understand that and work on that, um, that with our kids too, you can generally find some time that's more than 15 minutes in there to just do something like have a meal, go on a walk. We have, and, uh, where we live now, we have a golf cart. So go on a golf cart ride, enjoy, go on a walk, right? Just do what, uh, do something together and enjoy that. So number one is time management. And number two is when you do have conversations, ask questions that cannot be answered with one word, right? So say things like, oh, can you describe, um, you know, this or that or whatever? Um, or can you tell me more about or what happened at such and such? And if none of those are working and you're still getting, um, you know, the the uh, fine, right? A fine I don't know, right? Those type of things. Then really be specific and and get down to it and say, can you tell me three things that made you laugh today, right? And then just really ask, get very specific. And then there's three things that they will tell you. And they might be snarky about it at first, but laugh with them, right? Break the ice. And maybe a deeper, better conversation can come from there. But yeah, Ask them things, not just like, how was your day? Good, right? Did you want dinner at six? Yes. You want to avoid those type of, you know, I wouldn't even call them conversations, those type of questions that are just one word answers. Really get into it and have them, you know, explore their vocabulary a little bit more. And if they are struggling, ask them specifically two things or three things. No, I think that's so good. And it, and, you know, I, when you said about teenagers and especially the families that maybe decide, OK, we're going to start this real late, but we're going to start it. And and you might get that pushed back. But as parents, we've just got to persevere. Right. We just. Oh, yeah. We got to get past that. We can't let them out. Whatever it is, you know, where they think where they think they want. Outwit, outplay, just, outlast. <laughs> well, and then, yeah. And then and then. Yes. And then for them to finally see there's value in this. Yes. And and that's when you where you want to get. But sometimes it takes a while to get there, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, even it was funny, uh, you know, speaking with all these parents uh, recently over my last couple of days, and they said, you know, family weekend is going to be coming up in September. And you can ask your child, so do you want us to come? And sh- and the woman, the speaker was like, you know, some of you might get a no. You know, some of you might get a no. It's OK. I just saw you in August. You don't need to come or anything like that or just a no. Right. And she said, but every time then family weekend comes around and that child is sitting there without their family, seeing all these kids with their families and going, hmm, maybe I maybe I should have made a different choice. And then they call and they, you know, either say sorry or just even have a conversation to hear the people that love and care about them and and have been there to protect them this whole time, right? And so they will have walls up. It's part of their independence. It's part of their brain chemistry uh, that is being developed right now. They will have walls, but it doesn't mean that we can't help, like, climb over the walls. We can't knock on the walls and say, hey, I'm right here, right? You don't need to have a wall between us. I'm a safe place, right? This relationship, you and me, this is safe. Right. And so, um, yeah, just making them comfortable. That's cool. And there was a time I was trying to think how old my son was when he came to me to thank me for the way he was raised. But he was probably, mm. I think it was right before he got married. He's probably 23 or 24. And he said, I just want you to know all those times, those times when I tried to outweigh you or try to, you know, get my way over your guys' ways. Thank you for hanging in there. And so I think that may not come, you may not get that from him right now, but I think one day, that you will. And especially those that are starting a little late in it. You're probably going to get mm-hmm. more resistance. And if you start when they're young and the couples that have young kids, just encouraging them to begin that right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before I get to the last question, I've you've said a couple of times a term that I haven't heard that I loved. And you said hustle cut culture. Mm. And I love that. Where did you come up? Did you come up with that? Or what? You, I just think it's so, it's such a vivid picture of where we are today. It is. You know, I came up with that because I saw this coffee mug and uh, it just said hustle on it in gold letters with confetti all over it. And I was like, hustling is not fun. Like, why are we celebrating this? I hate hustling. I do it quite often because 
you know, like this week, my husband's out of town. We have orientation. The kids are working with their sleepovers, like all of this. I've been hustling for the last two days. And let me tell you, I am exhausted and all of the things, right? This is not something I want to stick on a mug and, you know, drink my tea out of. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, but that really is you know, hustle life, hustle culture that yeah. I see really celebrated out there. But the more we're hustling, the less we're thinking, right? And with in a in a world where critical thinking is really, you know, systematically being taken away more and more and more, we have to be very intentional about giving ourselves time to think every day. Because if we are stuck in this hustle culture, we're just on the conveyor belt that is going to wherever it's going to. We don't even know half the time instead of saying, hold on, where am I going right now? Is this actually where I want to go and stepping off? And so, yeah, hustle culture can be really dangerous. Yeah. And the way, and to know the way of a choice. We really do have a choice. Yeah. We don't have to buy into all that stuff all the time. Yeah. Last question uh, about your marriage. What are you loving about your marriage? right now in this stage? Um, this is such a, honestly, this is such a huge time of transition um, for us. And so I think the biggest thing that I'm just really embracing right now is the fact that we're going through this transition together. Like every day we get in and there was this, there was this point, um, we were, we're both youth leaders at our church and we were walking into our church a couple of weeks ago and we just look at each other and I was like, you ready to do the 95th hard thing this week together? And he's like, yep, let's go, you know? And so we're just, <laughs> and that's what we're doing, you know, right now. It just is life right now and, and the transitions and the hard things that we're going through, but we're going through them together. And so that is probably my favorite yeah. thing right now. And that's, I think that was God's intent that you mm -hmm. don't have to share if you're in a marriage you don't have to share that alone. You can you can walk through things together. And that's yeah. uh, that's that's so good. So, where can our listeners find out more about you if they want to find out uh, life getting ribbons, rhythms, and parenting things <laughs> like that? Where's the best find place to find you? Um, I love to keep it simple. So, everything that you would need can be found on my website, um, NellieHarden.com. Uh, my communities, my master classes, uh, my resources, um, all of uh, the program called Take the Lead, all of that can be found on my website. It's some I was on there, so much good stuff. And, and I think one of the things our, our team read the article you did for Focus on the Family, on Family on the Rocks, and just Loved it. Just raved about it. You know, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, thanks for your time. I love what you do. I, I think there's so much good golden nuggets in what we talked about today that can help so many families. And I appreciate you taking time to be with us. Oh, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. 